Well, thank you very much, all members of the panel. I mean, uh, the last one was uh, actually yet another one, bridging, uh, uh, underlining the, the, the necessity of uh, lifelong learning, and especially how academia can uh, can be in touch with with practitioners and how can can we reach, how can we reach them and how can we communicate with them and engage them. So now now we still have around 20 minutes for questions to one of our panel members. Uh, be that it's all from a different different nature, different experiences. So um, the floor is yours. So please, who wants to ask the first question? Yeah? Uh, uh, maybe for Peter and, and, and Sal as well, and, and maybe Yoni too. <clears throat> I think I, I kind of agree everything you said, but, but one thing... Uh, in a way, I don't agree. What Peter was saying, that it doesn't matter what you have in your hand. Uh, in my own teaching, which is in, in a, it's like a flipped classroom, students are preparing for the class, and then they come, and I, I, I make a, uh, it's not a request, I ask them kindly that if they could close their laptops, because I don't like the wall of apples between us, I say to take your notebook, if they don't have, I have notebooks with me, I give them all one. And then we work with the pen and paper and learn how to make uh, sketchbooks, how to take notes. So it, ac and it actually makes, makes a difference in there. I, I always have some students who say that this is ridiculous, I take my notes with the laptop. But I say that, please, could you try one time? Most of your classes, you don't do that. Try, try it with me. I appreciate it if you try. And, and the experience is, is quite nice. And, and often afterwards people see the value of that. And I think in education it, it's like a, uh, you do various of things. You, you can, you can uh, it's not one or other, all in all. And same, same with, with, the, with the Sala saying that, 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 that are we ready for our students to come and, and, and as, as they've been growing up with the digital <coughs> tools. <coughs> we did a one study and, and it's a qualitative study, so, so, so hard to make any generalization as such, but we find out with the interviews that quite many young students who are already digital natives when they come to BA program in our, our university, they were shocked when someone was saying or we were questioning this possibility of online learning. They said that I came to the university to have a serious discussion with the professors, that why can't we sit in a seminar room and have a discussion? They, they kind of see that that's their everyday life, what they spend a lot of time. And at the university, they would see something different, which is actually quite classical university seminar work, but, but they appreciate because they don't get it in their, in their uh, everyday life. I think there's two parts to that. The key word you mentioned in the middle of that was, was the word experience. And at the end of the day, it's that construction of experiences through which learning occurs. So whether that experience is to say, well, we're going to do something tactile now. We're going to move your dominant model of note taking to something different. And through the fear or the anger or the excitement that that creates, there's a learning experience that's generated. And I think that's the critical part of it is that, that experience. But I think the other part of it is the fact that there's a design to what you're doing. And that the criticality of design and thinking about what you're doing. See, my issue often when people say, oh, I don't like seeing a wall of laptops, is the first response to a lot of other people, and I think yours is different because you've got the design approach. A lot of other people say, oh, it's because they're all just looking at Facebook. And the brilliant thing is, guess what? They probably all are but they're using that to talk to their friends next to them, some of them, some of them are using it to look up, some of you look at their computer, look up Wikipedia, look up a term that they didn't understand, and some of them aren't listening. And that's fine, um, as long as the experience that you're trying to construct through that ends up supporting learning. And I think those two things, if you look at learning as an experience and what it creates, and, and I think that's the thing, because they're not thinking about the experience that that constructs. And I think the way you've approached it is bringing those two things in, that experience and design. That's the critical thing for me. I just wanted to follow up on Timu's question and, and on Peter's answer. While um, the question was posed around, are, are universities ready for students who've been online 
since they were five, I was actually back channeling with my partner who has just moved from higher ed to K to 12 in our little tiny government in Prince Edward Island um, because he's in the process of, of pulling together a communications piece that has to come out today on um, how we actually deal with that K to 12 end of things. And, and the big challenge is that to some extent we're taking kids who may have been, you know, I hate the term digital natives, but playing with iPads since they were two, etc. My kids are eight and 10. They have been systematically forced into compliance with non-digital forms of thinking, non-digital literacy types of activities, crappy rote work since they started school, right? And so, I mean, we work hard in their home lives to try to expand that and keep some of that curiosity and love of learning that Helen was talking about wanting for her daughter um, earlier today alive in them. But really, we have, in our at least Canadian school system, focused so much on the compliance end of things and the sort of outcomes and all those pieces that um, what, what we're doing is, is taking that early years, that play idea of learning, and then creating a system where by the time they get to university, you know, they think they would like sort of to be handed the right answers and spit them out um, because we've taught them that that's what it means to go to school. And I would say like some of when, when people are looking for that seminar experience, that classic experience, they're looking for engagement. They're looking for the idea that, oh my God, maybe I could actually connect with someone. And some of the work that, that we have done suggests that actually once they have the experience of potentially doing that in a learning environment um, that is digitized or even fully online, but is actually about connection, that is still meaningful. It doesn't have to necessarily be the classic face-to-face -face piece. It's the idea of getting beyond that sort of master regurgitate stuff that seems to matter. But we, we have a real problem, I think, right, from, right through the K-20 to sort of picture. Thank you. Yes, I just want to, to follow up on that and also to repeat something that Helen said earlier on today about having the, uh, the curiosity drummed out of our children through, through our education system. And uh, I think it's ad admirable that we, we want to develop excellent teaching and really, really good learning experiences. But actually, we're teaching to the test still because accreditation matters. And accreditation matters because ultimately it's the employers that, that and um, we're in a, a kind of reproductive education system in most parts of the world where if we don't get that piece of paper, we're not going to get those jobs. And I'm, I'm interested to know, Peter, that you said your, your students have uh, terrible, terrible teaching, but they get really, really good jobs. If they get really good teaching, are they still going to get good jobs? <laughs> <It's> quite... <laughs> um, I hope so, yes. <laughs> um, look, I think, I think some of that is connected to the fact that you're right, certification and accreditation are two fundamental processes that in a modern higher education world uh, protects many universities from some of the ravages of competition uh, because it's very easy to pick up various bits and pieces of knowledge and if you can find a way to aggregate them, you may, well be, you may be able to aggregate that. Um, I think at the end of the day, and, I'm, and I perhaps was being slightly hyperbolic, yes, we had horrendous NSS scores, but there's brilliant teaching going on in the school. There are some absolutely stunningly, amazingly teach, and I've been teaching for a long time, and they're great. Um, what I think is really important is a piece of work we did about five, uh, we did last year, and we asked students five years out uh, to do the same questions on the National Student Survey. So those of you who don't know the UK National Student Survey, it asks about um, whether you uh, got good teaching and learning, whether you got the resources you need to, to do it, whether you were satisfied with the experience that you had, a whole variety, it's about 20 questions. Um, we asked that same survey five years out and the scores went down. So there must be something that says that whilst the initial education experience was poor, it got you your first job, that sort of afterburners of that only last a certain period of time. And then where do you then go for lifelong learning? You're not going to go back to the LSE. You're going to go somewhere else. And then you're going to do your master's somewhere else. You're going to do your PhD somewhere else. You're going to tell everyone someone else. You're going to, if you take the North American model, you're going to donate and support that university, other universities other than that one. 
So there is a consequence, but in the short term, there's perhaps not the the um, the, the consequence for the for the institution. But there is a long-term consequence. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be the annoying yes, yes person and say that I actually agree with <laughs> most of what everybody's saying. So uh, going back to what Temo, Temo asked me and as well what Peter was saying, I think the, the key question here is actually exactly that. It's a quality, it's, it's good teaching. Uh, it means that if you have a good teaching design, if you have designed, the, you, you know what you are doing in the classroom. Yes, I think it's fine if you say that, please turn off your laptops or whatever, because this is, your, your, this is the design that you have for that course or that class. Uh, you have to have a reason for that. If you, ha if you don't have any reason for bringing laptops in, yes, people will go on Facebook. Yes, people will study Italian while they're trying to, you know, well, 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 they're supposed to do something. People are smart. They catch it instantly if you don't really know what you're doing. So I think teacher training here, like Yoni was saying, it plays a key role because if you go technology first, you'll get caught two seconds flat and then it's, it's fail. I would like to follow up on that and I have a question for, for you. When, when you were talking about elementary school and so on, you were saying that, okay, technology is being used more and more and so on and the teachers have to, to use it or not. But are teachers really prepared at that level already to, to use technology in the right way so that it's really something that is not overwhelming for children and that they're not really getting too much of it as well? Yeah, that's what we actually, my team is working on. We are, last year we trained about 18 or 1900 teachers to use, to use ICT in education. And our training we give is always pedagogical. The people we use for training other teachers, our teachers are training other teachers. Uh, that is one almost all the time. We also have academics, we also have some external experts every now and then, but most of our training is from, from teacher to teacher. And that, that is one way to, we try to make sure that uh, the training they get is not technological, it's pedagogical. Uh, and so they have been offered quite a lot of training. Um, the situation problem might be that, again, teachers have a choice. Teachers who are active or interested are the first to come to the training, and those who are less interested are the last to come. So that is our challenge to get every, every teacher involved and getting every teacher bought. But I think teachers are getting quite confident, and they are less and less, and I would say not many teachers anymore left that are totally against the idea. But it's a, it's a balance of things. I, I trust the teachers in this sense that they, they have the national curriculum uh, which states what they had to do, uh, we have the we we try to offer them ideas on what to do and and it's up to the teacher then to balance and when is the time to use the laptop when it's time to put it away if we are discussing don't use it if you if I'm just talking to you if you if you if you're making notes it might be useful for you so that in the end it's all again up to the teachers uh, teachers professional skills pose a question to um, to Alvin, um, whether you could elaborate a little bit more, I mean, this, this core project, I've been following it a little bit over the past years, and I think it's, it's, it's one of the most fascinating projects I've come across over, over these years. And I think there's various things apart from the, from the really revolutionary way you're teaching uh, content, it's also the combination then what you said with the pedagogical um, and, and making it online. But if you could say a little bit how you really made it work to work together, because I, I also see that online um, is this incredible possibility to make collaboration work over uh, across institutions and how you made that work for this project because I, I, I assume it was not obvious in the beginning, it was not easy, so how you, how you did that and also if you can say something whether you have, it's an open educational resource so it's used differently at, at the universities, I assume elaborated further 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 develop, but whether you have a feedback from students, whether there's something that, that you say, okay, there we got good feedback, on this we got bad feedback, what is working, what is not working? So, so, so on, the, on the first of those, which is how, how it was made to work, um, I, 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 th I think there has been um, a desire to change a lot of things about the economics curriculum even, even before 2008, but, it, but it, for various reasons it was incredibly difficult to do. And um, 
Um, and the way it worked was that we had a series of um, symposia, in, uh, largely based in the UK, because that's where the project was led from, but there were international symposia, and we talked through with uh, academics, and there were students there, and, and uh, policy people, about what the issues were and what the, what the frictions would be. And it seemed that the big, one of the biggest frictions was um, what do you leave out? You know, that, that was always going to be a problem. You know, we're, we're so wedded to you have to, you have to learn A and B before C and so on. What, what bits are you going to leave out and how are you going to put all this exciting new stuff in? So that was, that was one of the challenges. Um, and then I, um, I, th I think uh, essentially we made it work largely because I th of, of, it relates to something that Jeff said. There were places in which um, there was already a, a spirit of a, some degree of innovation and autonomy uh, with, within the departments. And we, we had support from senior members of staff. So in my institution, for example, I just happened at that time to be the director of, for undergraduate studies in my school. Um, but, but that's important, I think, you know, and so, so the pilot institutions, uh, uh, we, we were quite, in, it, it was quite important to us that the pilot institutions were very well known as well, and that was a kind of political decision to be made. So we had to satisfy the desire of people um, who, want, who, were, who were reluctant to see any part of the syllabus go, and the way we dealt with that was to say, well, we're not getting rid of it all, we, we're just not kind of, we're just not teaching it, but it's there, you know, you can, by modularizing everything and moving it into different places, you can kind of um, you can kind of satisfy everybody at the same time and have your cake and eat it. So we did what we wanted to do, but those people who were reluctant could see that it was, um, it, it, you know, we weren't throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so, so so to speak. So so it satisfied it satisfied them as well. I think the fact that it was uh, UCL, um, Bristol, uh, Sciences Po, those those kinds of institutions meant that there was a certain kind of um, sort of respect for, you know, the, 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 the fact that there was this retained rigor and it didn't threaten, you know, it did, didn't kind of threaten the syllabus in some way. And I, and I think these kinds of political considerations are really quite important, really, to, in, in order to get buy-in. We had, we had senior support from government figures and, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, someone, someone in the Treasury said that this is, this is the right way to teach. You, can, you know, that kind of... That kind of um, senior support was very important. Um, it was funded uh, initially by the Institute for New Economic Thinking and then by Friends Provident Foundation, and, and so it had the funds to get, get the thing moving. So I, so I think it was a series of sort of strategic decisions and then the pedagogic decision um, and, the, and, and, and the way we organized the course online, I think, made it acceptable to, to a num number of people. With regard to students, um, it's, it started with students. I mean, it started with these um, students uh, complaining about the fact that we weren't talking about things which uh, related to their experience. And, and so it was important that what we put in the syllabus um, was, uh, was relatable to student experience all the time. Because we were teaching, we were teaching models where students, could, and this was a real problem, I think, you know, students who were doing politics or sociology could go home to their parents after the, you know, Christmas of the first year or at the end of the first year and talk about what they were learning in relation to what was happening around them. That was really difficult for economic students because they were, le they were learning models of perfect competition that didn't enable them to talk about Brexit or, or, or at the time, the financial crisis. It, there was just this enormous gap between their lived experience and what was going on. So I think actually students, it was easier for them to satisfy them. Um, they, but, but I will say that, that, that something I said earlier, that I, we were surprised at the demand for a print copy. So everything's online, and one of the ways that we created the motivation was by putting a lot of narrative in. So all the examples are taken, lots of examples from economic history and bubbles in the past and you know, long history about climate change and so on. So it's very, very uh, readable text, and, it, and, and it's quite sort of long in that sense, and you know, lots of narrative uh, pulls, and it's very story-like. So it's not very textbook-like in that sense. It's very unlike a normal sort of economics textbook, which is in small chunks. And, and it's in relation to the point I made earlier. I, I'm, I'm not, I, I think students of economics were used to reading sort of manageable chunk-type material in textbooks, in boxes, and that kind of thing. We did uh, something which I think 
made it quite difficult. We wrote it like a, a text book. You know, we wrote it like a, 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 a continuous piece of prose. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and that seemed odd to students, that that went online, because th they needed to read for a long time. There were long chapters. And they found that quite difficult. And then there was a demand for, um, for a kind of print copy. But I think we probably overestimated the ability of students or, or the desire for students to do everything online. Um, so note taking and all those kinds of things. And I think that the, the challenge here is that it's not that it's the wrong thing to do, but that what we seem to not do is train students on you know how to take notes with these technologies and it's the same kind of problems how to work independently what critical thinking is and those are those are always those challenges have always been there but but sometimes we kind of think that the technology will do it for us but it doesn't and and that gap i think we never really filled it with the old the old methods of teaching and we we still have to do that i think at the moment thank you very much anybody else yeah I have a question for Sala, actually, that touches on that. Um, I found your example particularly interesting because I watched my own brother, who's 14 now, grow up and, and go to an elementary school and a middle school that was heavily focused on learning with technology. So since he was nine years old, he's been using, submitting all of his assignments on um, Google, on Google's education platforms. He's been using smart boards, iPads, uh, laptops, everything. I mean, his electives in high, that he was taking in high school were probably equal to what I was starting to do in college with coding or anything like that. And so, but my question is, um, what do you do to bridge the gap for the kids who didn't grow up with those technologies because if higher education will shift to accommodate children who grew up in a technologically heavy learning environment, um, I mean 30 minutes away from my brother's school there's a underprivileged neighborhood where these kids don't have any access to laptops or smart boards or anything. So how do teachers not only educate themselves on how to use the technology and how to teach with it, but also make sure that none of the students are getting left behind if they didn't have the privilege to grow up in that kind of learning environment? Who do you want to answer? You? Thanks, Jess. It's a good question. I think that's a um, what you're talking about is basically teacher MO because differentiation has always been there. It's uh, people who sit next to each other, they have different backgrounds and you, you need to know how to, how to handle that. I think it's a, it's, fair, it's a fair question and I think something that we, something that we will have to uh, take care of is that we have to realize that then this, um, I don't know, ICT know-how will then also be a, one of the things that you have to be able to differentiate somehow, so you have to bring the people to the level. Um, An interesting from the other point of view is that sometimes it goes the other way. My daughter is 12, and uh, she likes math. I don't know, she's a bit weird. Uh, she loves math. And, uh, but she doesn't get enough of that, because her teacher still teaches the, in the kind of you know, the book way, and they are, going, they, they are now doing percentages, and, and you know, she's not allowed to go much further. So what she does is that she goes online on her own to Khan Academy, you probably know about that, and uh, she studies coding there on her own. And she's uh, now doing high school math just for fun, <laughs> because she likes that. So, yeah. so my point is that there, this will always happen. If you have access to computers, there will be a kid in the room who will be bored to death if, if the teacher is not equipped to handle the fact that you know, this kid is actually doing a lot more advanced math than what the book is teaching and so on. So it's a, it's a good question. I don't have a proper answer except that, again, we come back to teacher know-how, something that we just need to learn how to do. Final one? Yeah, yeah. quickly, I, good question. I, I think in, in 1970s, when, when there was the last renewing of the Finnish basic education, there was this discussion that should we give in school homeworks because in every home there's no a desk for a child to, to do the homework. And I think it's a funny 
issue, but actually it's a relevant question to, to do that. How, how much do we rely on the, on the kids having at home access to, to internet and so on? Uh, on the other hand, we also in Finnish schools, there's, we, we teach skiing for everybody. Everybody don't have skis, but in, then for those who don't have this in school days, skis for everybody so everybody got a chance to to learn how to ski so you can arrange these things if you if you if you think about it that that it's an issue uh but i i've been i have to say that well Al, alvin we, we discussed during the break that that you have massive classes like like the numbers of, of students and i think this is something which which we haven't touched too much that the discussion the scale and 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 differences in that and, and related to that too, I was just this autumn teaching new course uh, partly online and, and having this kind of seminar, seminar type of working with the, with the video conference. And I was really surprised. Uh, my students were surprising me how fluent they were. I didn't need to have any instructions of using that. I just sent the link and they were all fluent in there and they were able to operate. It's so kind of everyday life for those who come that, that, that are, they just manage. Um, but, but the difference between the scale is, 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 of course, I think I'm quite privileged having these classes of maximum 40 students and, and, and then, then, but still I say that with the online, that, that I was going to say that with this, this experiment with these uh, 40 students, I noticed that, that the experience actually probably this kind of seminar type of working uh, end up to be better than happening face to face. Uh, one reason was that 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 uh, there was a, the assignments for the sessions were better done than when it's in a face-to-face. -face. For some reason, people were better prepared for those online classes. I don't know why. Uh, one reason why it could be is that I was also having an expert visiting those online video conference sessions. So often the writer of the article or the writer who is giving the TED talk or something was present in there for questions and answers. And I could have never do that without the online connection. So, so in a way, it was an online seminar and have to be better than the face-to-face -face seminar already in that ex example. Jean-Michel, I didn't see that you asked for the floor, so no? If you have no time, that's fine. No, we have, we have two more questions, so if you want, you can, okay. yeah. As I said previously, I'm 66, I'm a full professor. But I didn't start up being a professor, I did start by working in factories. And I do remember that the old traditional way of controlling the workflow in factories is to put engineers coming to you and with a big sheet and measuring everything you do. And it's old stuff because it did stop in the 80s because we did find another way of controlling work in factories, what we called in France, Japanese way, instead of uh, Ford and um, another thing. What's the purpose of my talk? In higher education, I do not know teaching for kids or teenagers. In higher education, teaching is 15, 20% of your time you have to do, but you have also to clean your shoes, so you do teaching, but you have to do. But uh, that's not what you do. What you do is something else. What you do is uh, thinking, reading, discussing, writing. We call it research. But if we are frank, we should call it thinking. Because this research is also defined by us. And the interest of going up into the career is that you can self-define your, your, uh, your topic. Of course, if you are a PhD student, someone will tell you it's a good or it's a bad PhD project. But if you are up in your career, you are self-defining your research. So you are singing all the time. You are not working. You are doing what you like. And uh, half of the things being said in this uh, session, not to say to third or this day, is that, uh, in a sense, this will either disappear or be m much more severely constrained because um, students uh, won't be students anymore. They will be adults learning. 
and they will learn outside on the shoulders or, or clearly not with uh, professors, etc., etc., etc. And this has to be considered because incentives, existing set of incentives in higher education has to be considered. Jeff is astute because Jeff said, okay, we will, uh, we will take professors volunteering. So as they are volunteers, they volunteer. That's what I do at front school, I volunteer. But okay, but, but uh, those not volunteering. And, and how do you see this path to the full uh, openness and transparency of higher education? How will professors be put in this process? Could you give me hints, ideas, or experiences? I mean, to some degree, Peter also mentioned one of one of the mechanisms that one uses because because except I mean this is not true of, of all higher education settings, so we need to be somewhat careful about it. But in general, um, the autonomy, um, individual autonomy of of academic staff of faculty, is actually deemed by universities to be important, and it's particularly important in their research area. So it's hard to tell them exactly what to do in teaching because you're not going to tell them exactly what to do in research. So, so we use a model that I guess everybody uses, which is that you work with those who are the willing and the interesting. You find those who critically are interested in willing and are highly influential. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, our approach has been to support and to work with faculty who have got strong research reputations and who are well respected and to use them within the faculties and within the schools as the leaders in their areas. The other thing that we've done, and we did this particularly with the MOOCs when we developed them, is that we do not rely on single professors because their effect is limiting. And so when people came to us and said, we would like to build an online course or we would like to build a MOOC, we said, yeah, but we only do it with teams. So, you know, there've got to be three or four of you. And, and there are two reasons for that. One of them is that it's harder within a faculty or a school to argue that four insensible people are crazy. You know, that whereas one person can be crazy, it's harder to tell a team of people they're crazy. Uh, but, uh, and, and also there's a durability because if one leaves, there are still three left. Um, and, but also because it diminishes that effort of the cost of innovation because you distribute it. And so instead of having to fight, I mean, I don't know whether your universities use workload planning, but we use workload planning for our faculty. So they have an agreement with their boss, with their line manager, whatever, what they are going to do the next year, and we try to balance them so that the workloads are the same. And so if you take a full-on innovation load and put it on one person, you're going to have to take something off them. Whereas if you put it on four people, you don't have to take so much away. And in fact, actually, academics being what they are, and they don't count their time, and we don't count their time properly, they do it anyway because they're interested and it isn't too much. And so I think you can apply tactics of finding the right people, influential people, people who are prepared and have the expertise and are recognized well within their domain and you use them. And gradually that, that curve that we've, which we've used for so long of the innovators through to the laggards, you, 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 you are aiming to move that big middle group forward and the laggards well, I've always said that essentially it was retirement or Kalashnikov. You know, they, actually, in general, in university, retirement, because Kalashnikovs are not, you know, a standard <laughs> academic tool, and we don't fire people. So, so over time, that there'll always be a laggard group, but the trick is to try to get it as small as possible and to draw as many of your bulk in. And so, for instance, my argument about about everybody should graduate from a university with experience of fully online, we are tackling by introducing fully online modules into our bachelor's degrees. Mm -hmm. And if you introduce enough, faculty will, in a sense, have no choice but to mm -hmm. teach on some of them. 
um, because that will become part of the normal workload. So it's all about tricks <laughs> to manage that process of, of, of herding the squirrels, because they're three-dimensional cats, you know, herding the squirrels forward. Thank you very much. Can so I just say how well you did that, Jeff, too, with, with those teams in those MOOCs? Because one of the other things that having, I participated in one of your first MOOCs, and it operated much less like a major university MOOC and more like the early Canadian experimental models, because you had multiple people involved as faculty, and therefore they were actually engaging in reciprocal. And, and we talked a lot earlier today about network participation and collabor collaboration online. If you are going to run online courses that just operate like a giant lecture, then you're not modeling those things. But Edinburgh's were one of the very few sort of major university models in MOOCs that did that. Last question, Ismail. Yes, uh, I, I just want to very strongly contest the idea that technology is creating inequality. I think that we've been testing the knowledge hypothesis, or the knowledge gap hypothesis for almost 40 years. And I think that there is strong evidence that inequality is created by technology uh, are a symptom, not, not, the, not the disease. And the disease comes from elsewhere uh, and comes from education, for instance, and comes from income. And actually, uh, and this is my own perspective, but I'm sure that the Open University has the same data that we have. Uh, out of 100,000, 150,000 students or alumni that we have, I would say that 90% of them could not have studied unless they could have done that online, which we offered, and I think that you have the same data. So uh, I'm sorry to end up with this, uh, like this argument, but I, I really think that it's really misleading and it, it's doing uh, us a very, very bad favor to keep thinking about how the digital divide is created by technology and not the other way around, that the digital divide is the, the outcome of another divide which comes from way, 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 way behind. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think that we will have to repeat such, a, such an exercise <laughs> probably because there's so many things that we did not touch upon in our short time. But if I can just recap what the panel of, uh, of the session number three is that uh, there is no escape possible. So uh, we will have to do it. <laughs> we have no choice. We will have to do it. How we are going to do it, when we are going to do it, maybe that's the only choice we have. I think we need strong leadership in order to initiate such a, a change. Uh, good teaching remains something which uh, we should not forget. Of course, can be supported by technology. And uh, we, we have had several tips and tools and tricks that we can use and that we can uh, remember in order to get so far. And uh, lastly, I mean, it's a never ending exercise. So it starts with children and it ends up in, we don't know. So thank you very much, all of you for participating and I hand over to Anika and Jean-Michel for the closing remarks. Thank you.